Hey everybody, welcome to another uh, EOS Ignite Governance Study Group session. Uh, it's number 13, so we've uh, kind of uh, got the numbers up here um, by year end. <laughs> and, uh, and we're doing one last session here before the new year. So glad to have Thomas Cox here. And uh, Hey, thank you. Yeah, yeah, so. I hope you feel good about doing 13 episodes already. This has been quite the undertaking you've done. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fun. It's, it's you know, it's, uh, it's fun to just chat about this. I think it's it is incredibly important. So, um, but you know, any, anything we could do, anything we could do to push things forward, I, I'm I'm happy to help with. So. Yeah, and just so folks know that you know this call right now that we're doing, we're recording as you're watching it. It came together just like a couple hours ago. I'm like, so hey, June, it's uh, you know it's Thursday. You often do things on Thursday. Anything going on today? And he's like, <laughs> nothing scheduled. You want to do something? And I'm like, <laughs> Why not? You know, <laughs> I'm always up for a quick conversation on on the state of governance. Yeah, it looks like we got Max and uh, one or two other folks out there in the audience uh, hey, watching going? live. Mel Pierce is there. Nice. How's it going, Mel? Mel's a regular. He's always he's always here. You can always count on Mel to come in. So, <laughs> Very awesome. nice. so Max too. Super cool. Max is super that. cool. Regular as well. So yeah, well, you get pretty high viewership on your stuff, and I think you've you've asked a lot of really important questions over the last 12, 13 episodes. So um, I've got a very short agenda of stuff that I thought would make be a good kind of end of year stuff to talk about. Um, but if folks have questions, or you join if you've got questions as we go, I'm I'm very happy to switch gears and and just you know talk in whatever direction folks want to go. Um, the before I talk about EOS mainnet stuff, which I think was what most of us would care about, uh, I want to mention something about the EOS Alliance, because the Alliance is sort of a servant of EOS mainnet, as well as being a servant of the other sister chains that are EOS software-based, Ono, Warbly, Warbly, Telos, and so on. Uh, and so the Alliance just had its um, fourth big board meeting uh, in December, about a week and a half ago, and I got my... Uh, I say my board because they're my boss. I'm the executive director of the EOS Alliance uh, as one of the two jobs that I work. And I'm really pleased that the Alliance is taking this very servant leadership, like how can we make mainnet better? What can we do to help things along? Uh, we will take no power. We will not exert influence. We won't tell people what, how to vote or even whether to vote. We'll ask the question and help people come up with their own decisions which is why I want to support the heck out of your project, John, because you're doing exactly that. Uh, so I've got a, a couple of slides to show real quick. Oh, absolutely. Uh, let's see. And I have to open the Chrome web store and add the Crowdcast screen sharing widget first. Didn't I just do this? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, is it, it's not a new computer. Uh, uh... Yeah, but I use Chrome. Uh, 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 this uh, these different Chrome identities to uh, manage my things like uh, you know where I'm logged in and which bookmarks go where and stuff. So uh, hopefully you can see this uh, status report slide. Sure. Okay. Great. Okay. And. Uh, there's a version of this that's going to be published for uh, general consumption. Up, uh, oh, Mel sees it. Excellent. And so we've got an overview slide here that just hopefully it's not too tiny. You can see that it just talks about what the alliance is. And this is the uh, an earlier version of the mission. It's just to serve the community by facilitating conversations. Uh, and what became clear looking at, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin and and other other projects as well as our own. Um, a decentralized community does need focal points, just like what you're doing here. Uh, and to have a group dedicated to helping make those focal points be effective uh, is what we do. And we've got a set of board members, uh, seven currently, and we're going to start doing elections uh, probably in January to fill to replace the board members with elected members. These are all appointed by just the people who bootstrapped it and put the money in. Uh, We've also got a steering group of people who uh, offer input, and that's not a complete list. Uh, and the idea here is that um, the Alliance is a self-created educational nonprofit. We're going to be based, uh, we believe, in Antigua. We're like this far from getting our 
legal entity created uh, and then opening up a bank account. Uh, and at some point we'll start selling, you know, memberships for folks and, and really formalize the, the way we uh, run things uh, internally. But the mission is really, really clear. And I want to show that to you. This, this is what we agreed to in December, um, a few, about a week and a half ago. And it's this, uh, it's called the global ends statement. I'll explain that in a second. And the statement says the EOS community will have robust focal points for communication, coordination, and information in order to effectively self-organize toward creating a decentralized secure internet. And you'll notice nowhere does it say what exactly the Alliance does to bring it about. In fact, what the board wants me to do as executive director is use my judgment to do whatever is needed to bring about these ends. And they're all just gonna judge me on whether we're successful in bringing it about. So that's on the one hand, it's exciting to have that much autonomy. On the other hand, it's a little daunting to you're gonna be held accountable for results. So that's cool. And if you've never heard the phrase global ends, you're not alone. That's um, straight out of something called the Carver model of policy governance. Um, I did some research before I accepted the role of executive director and I wanted to make sure that I brought, you know, the best thinking I could to the organizational development of the entity. Uh, and I'd heard about Carver ages ago. And when I look back into it, what Carver says is you can either tell people what to do and how to do it, in which case you're responsible, not them for results, or you can specify what outcome you want and some guidelines of what not to do and then leave people free within those clear guidelines to experiment and, and try things. Uh, and so Carver is the only system in the world that I found that really clearly delineates what the board can and can't say and do and what staff are responsible for. And it's a very powerful system and it lets, it gives people accountability. Uh, it requires the board to be accountable. It requires me and the rest of staff to be accountable. Uh, so if you, if you're ever looking to, kill a couple of hours reading some really cool stuff about corporate governance. Um, the Carver model is fascinating. It's been around for several decades. It's associated with excellent results. Uh, and I became a big fan of it, which is why I championed it. And uh, so we talk about global ends. Basically, you get to make one statement of what you want your organization to, to achieve in the world. Like ex organizations exist for a reason. And usually it's to make something be different, be better. And so you're challenged to say, okay, what's the difference? What will be different in the world because this organization exists? And the answer for us was, well, that the community will have these focal points. And it's not that the community gets centralized or the community gets controlled. It's the community self-organizes and has the focal points it needs to self-organize in order to create a decentralized secure internet. And so how are you going to do that? Well, there's lots of ideas of how you can do it. And we get to pursue those to the best of our knowledge and ability and funding and time and energy. But that's the North Star right there. And if I move the ball in that direction as executive director of the Alliance, then I will be doing the right thing. And if I move in some other direction other than this, what you see on screen, I'm doing it wrong. So I want to challenge uh, Max and Mel and who's the, oh, Patrick. Hey, Patrick, uh, and you, Jun, to say, okay, what do you like about it and what excites your curiosity or confusion? Because you're amongst the first to see this outside of the board. Yeah, so it's a great question, Thomas. Uh, if anybody's out there uh, wants to chime in, feel free. One uh, thing you like, just I want to know one thing you like. It could be a phrase, could be a word, could be the energy around it, whatever you like. Start with that. And I want to challenge uh, Mel, Max, and Patrick to type something in. Yeah. Just one thing you like, man. And I'll tell so, you my favorite. I'll tell you my favorite in just a minute, but I'll let them weigh in first. And yeah. you go ahead. Go, go ahead, Jen. Yeah, so I, I like the end. And then I do have questions about, you know, you know the, the internet, you know, the decentralized, secure internet. Uh, I think that's, that, that is a great goal to have and that's like a big hairy audacious goal it's like we're not just going to make a main net we're going to make a main net that serves 
that profound need of humanity because we have a centralized insecure internet today and it's bad it's just getting worse we have state level actors who like pay pe pay professionals send them to school and pay them full-time salaries to hack the internet north korea does it china does it russia does it we know the nsa does it uh, other nations are doing it and so we, everyone's attacking security and everyone's attacking and, and you know centralizing power here and there and humanity is the loser so i think if blockchain is going to come into its own and and pay the dividends that we all want it to pay uh i think that's that's a big part of it right there mel thinks facebook are worse <laughs> i'm not going to get into a fight over who's worse man there's a lot there's a lot of of uh a lot of blame to point around Patrick says something nice. He says, Thomas, you rock. Thank you, sir. It's exactly that. If we want an everyone's open society and DAO, we need a decentralized secure internet. I think that's it. Totally true. And that includes, you know, secure wallets and easy key management and good crypto and um, the avoidance of, of central points of attack. So anyway, here, here's the Alliance big statement. Now I'm going to show you the next uh, page where I, we have a zoom in because this is high and kind of vague. And so in the Carver model, you're allowed to then drill in a little bit. And so again, here's the global end statement in a smaller font. So there's room for, you know, specifically 1.1, the community will have the robust, the robust infrastructure needed for proposing voting on and implementing referenda. Now it doesn't mean that the Alliance writes the code, but we'll champion it. And I think we did a little bit of help in uh, pulling together and encouraging um, the referendum working group. Although, of course, the vast majority of the credit for that goes to uh, uh, EOS Nation and EOS Canada and Generios and that whole long list of people who've done tremendous work on the referendum and the tally code. Um, but, you know, my, part of my job is to support that. Uh, and I will continue to do that. And then specifically inside of that, 1.1.1, the EOS mainnet will have a functioning constitution. Now, it doesn't say which one. It just it has to have one. And the only reason it has to have one is because it's set up in a way that it doesn't work without one. 1.2, uh, the EOS community will have well-facilitated, organized, and purposeful public groups to discuss well-defined topics related to the greater mission of EOS. Now, is that Telegram? I don't know. Maybe. Is it threaded forums on a website? Could be that. Could it be that, you know, I make a point of supporting Jun anytime he needs a guest? That could be too. Whatever, it, it, all of those. Um, but you see that the, this is all outcome-based. It's not, you know, process, not activity-based because you can spend a lot of time and money on activities and not reach your ends. And that's why this is stated as ends, achievements, outcomes. Uh, 1.3, the EOS community receives comprehensive, accurate, timely, and relevant information about the EOS ecosystem. Uh, and right now, the way the Alliance is supporting that piece is to uh, translate articles between English, uh, Mandarin, Chinese, and Korean, and Russian, uh, largely through volunteer efforts that we've helped uh, organize and coordinate uh, and couldn't do it without the community. And this translation effort is a massive piece of um, what we're trying to accomplish so that when somebody in Korea, well, the Koreans have spent hours and hours, probably twice, like 20 or 30 people who get on these calls, they work for like three, four hours at a stretch on the Korean version of the constitution that they put forth as a, as a candidate. That's massive. And they did it in part because we encouraged it and we recruited somebody to show up every week and host the call. And that's uh, David Margulies, you know, and he might've done it on his own anyway, but then again, he might not have. So we took it on ourselves with the Alliance to ask him to please do that. And now we're paying him a small stipend every month for his time and energy. Uh, and then the last point here is that the EOS community benefits from constructive and diplomatic relationships between any and all stakeholders that may impact long-term success and the inclusivity of the mission. And that includes, but it's not limited to token holders, exchanges, block producers, DAP developers, DAP users, regulators, policymakers, 
media side chains, forks, blockchain industry players, law enforcement, and influencers. We need everybody to be able to communicate well with each other if we're going to get where we need to go. And I'm not promising that we can make them play well together, but part of my task is, and, and my, my staff's task, is to continually attempt to engage people in constructive dialogue. So that's what you're going to see. Uh, yeah, oh, Justin chimes in. Yes, the Korean community has done so much good work. You are so right, Justin. And Justin himself has done so much good work. Uh, it's a lot of nice things we can say about Justin. And uh, just to give you a sense of um, how we've fared so far, um, this is just a bar graph of, you know, one, two, three, or four the different heights, up to four meetings per day on Zoom, uh, sponsored by the Alliance for things like um, Justin's uh, Project Synchronize or the 12 week long constitution series where we ask people to look article by article at the different constitution drafts just to be educated uh, so that we could do, you know, that whatever is next. So we had regular online meetings, we had solid attendance anywhere from, you know, two, three, five, ten up to 150. And I would say the average is probably somewhere around 30 or more. Uh, just tremendous uh, attendance. And uh, the, the Zoom platform gives you this uh, metric of the number of minutes of the meeting times the number of people who are online. And so if it's like a 10 people for 10 minutes, it'd be 100. Or 10 people for 30 minutes would be 300. So you can see we've got numbers around 1,000 to 2,000 stretching up above 4,000 for a few of them. So these are calls with, you know, people are, are connected. They're, they're staying on, they're doing work. Uh, and that's, that's a big deal. And I also want to brag a little bit about, this is like everything on one, on one page. So we've got really strong community engagement. And I'm not even counting all the work you've done, John, although I'd love to count it and put you a, have, so have a, the Jun section uh, for all the reach you get. Plus, of course, your recordings get a lot of reach. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to brag about is, is this uh, picture of how many different articles we've put just in the Chinese media about EOS. And that's, you know, announcements about upcoming uh, applications, uh, just anything and everything that's going on in the world of EOS. So, you know, if you, you saw the global end statement that we're going to help the community communicate, I think we're, we're starting to do a pretty darn decent job. Uh, and I'm real proud of my staff who are who are doing all this. So, but I didn't come on to to just you know say hey here's the alliance here's what we're up to. I also okay. want to say hey here's the alliance. What do you want us to do for you? Let us know. We'll see if we can. Maybe we're already trying to do it. And I think I can close screen share. Yes, and uh, switch gears and talk about some other things. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's so, excellent. It's yeah, great. it's really important, and um, I want to put that out and also share the uh, the slide deck with folks uh, as soon as I can figure out how to turn that into a PDF again. Um, but I made some notes before we got on the call, and I also wanted to ask your your live audience here, you know, what's something that they'd like to talk about or, or hear me talk about maybe uh, around just the broad topic of governance, whether it's block producers, voters, exchanges, apps, wallets, um, end users, token. Don't ask me about token price. I hate that. I can't, <laughs> say anything, I can't say anything useful about it. I don't understand how tokens get priced. Uh, but, you know, utility. Yep, got a question. There's a question. More east-west communication, and is the Alliance able to help with that? I totally agree, and uh, I'm really uh, pleased that we've got several uh, volunteer driven projects that a couple of block producers have created something called uh, the bridge project, uh, which involves translating things, uh, articles, news coverage, opinion pieces between, uh, English and other European languages and, uh, Chinese primarily. And I think also Korean, uh, and I'd love to see more Japanese, uh, as well. Uh, and in addition to, and I, and I want to start with the ones that I know about that are out there, the, the wire, uh, there's three or four others 
sort of news hub type uh, outlets that are doing translation and outreach and, and communication. Um, in addition to that, we uh, are doing things through the Alliance very specifically. So that, that chart I just showed you of articles, many of those were originally English language uh, and that we saw, hey, this is important for the Chinese community to, to see this. And so let's translate it into Chinese. Uh, or it was Chinese, we put it into Korean or we put it in English or where, what have you. And so the, the Chinese outreach graph was just stuff into China uh, by our staff out there. Myra, you may know, Myra Wang. And uh, Myra used to belong with, uh, be an employee over at uh, EOS Gravity uh, and then joined the Alliance back in July, August. And she's now recruited a small staff of uh, two or three really excellent people, uh, Winnie, Candy, uh, a couple of others uh, who are very many, I should have said Minnie and Candy uh, are the two that I'm aware of. I think there's a guy named David possibly. Um, it just came on recently uh, who are very active in, in community management. Uh, they've got one weird thing about the Chinese market, by the way, is um, WeChat is the big channel over there. They don't do telegram. But WeChat is limited to 500 people per channel. So if you've got more than 500 people interested in you, and we do, you have to chop it up into sub-channels of 500 each. And then you've got to manage multiple channels. You can't just sit in one. You've got to like skip around between a bunch of them. So it's pretty labor intensive. Uh, and I think they do a great job. Um, and Mel says, um, well, before I acknowledge Mel, uh, Justin says, hey, this community is really incredible and a pleasure to work so close to this fantastic uh, community. I think you're totally right. Mel points out that it'd be good to get even more engagement from the US community. I think that's totally true. I'm looking forward to the referendum uh, helping us get that kind of uh, engagement because engagement, of course, is a generic word. It could mean lots of things. It could mean reading, could mean writing, could be talking, could be listening, could be telegram, could be video chat, could be developing apps right? What, what is engagement? Well, what would you like it to be? Uh, and we need all those things. Uh, and by the way, Mel, you can count on me to be doing my best to get that engagement up further and further. And I would love any thoughts or suggestions, very open-minded to uh, people's ideas. Uh, Patrick points out, user identity be more effective when we have the block one wallet with secure enclave. Uh, and, right, and not just theirs, but you know, maybe a host of different wallets uh, are, hopefully will be coming. I know smartphone makers are starting to get serious about adding secure Enclave capability. Uh, iPhone has one spec, Android has a thousand specs. So you gotta figure out which, which one you wanna develop to as a developer. Um, but yeah, we need uh, the ability to manage keys securely and easily. Uh, all crypto needs that desperately. Um, and I had some thoughts I'll share with you if you want to go in that direction on how reputation and identity might manifest on a blockchain. Uh, Max asks, that it's looking like we'll have many sister chains on EOS. Can you speak of uh, foreseen governance problems we'll have across the chains? Oh, absolutely. So. Good segue into governance. Thank you, Max. Um, the Alliance's mission is to serve all EOS-based public chains in the entire EOS community. So it's not just mainnet, although mainnet's kind of like the big one that gets most of the attention. Uh, but we try to be really nice to Telos, Warbly, Ono, um, any others that might be coming. Um, in fact, I recently brought on staff uh, CJ Anders, and CJ worked very intimately with the Telos group for quite some time and knows that uh, group very, very well and has helps us. She's kind of the hub of our relations across the, uh, the sister chains for that reason. She's an excellent operations person. Uh, and the governance challenges are going to be interesting because, um, well, Ethereum, let me, let me tell you, uh, you may have heard me mention this in the past. It's a great story. So back before we launched, um, it was in May, uh, we had uh, uh, heard about the Ethereum people putting together this big 
blockchain governance meeting. It was going to be three days devoted to Ethereum governance. And I thought, oh man, I wish I could go. You know, I'm looking forward to reading what they what they publish because that's going to be great because it's Ethereum. They got you know millions of people using it. It's huge. It's been around for four years. You know, they've been wrestling with these problems for much longer than we have. I'm sure we'll get a lot of really good, interesting, you know, insights from them. And uh, it's hard to overstate how disappointed I was when they when they could, were done with their three days and they issued their joint statement and it said uh, that moving forward we need to identify who our stakeholders are and we must find ways to find out what they think. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> That's as far as you got. You've been at this for four years and you spent three days with all your best and brightest and you've just come up with a definition of governance. It's like, yeah, you got to know who your stakeholders are and what they think. Yeah, that would be good. So when we launched, we were ahead of them. And that's even without a referendum in place. Uh, and I wish we'd had a referendum in place when we launched. Uh, but you know, we've got token weighted voting. Uh, may not be ideal, but it's what we have to start with. And hopefully by January 1st, if things go well, contact your block producer friends and tell them to sign the uh, the 15 of 21 multi-sig to implement the EOS Canada uh, forum code for referendum, please. Call your friends. Uh, but with any luck, we'll get, I'm hoping by January 1st, the, uh, the referendum will be up and running. Uh, and that's going to be a, big deal because we've had um, a number of struggles in our young community around governance. Uh, one of them is that the voters have not been activist voters in the way that we expected them to be in the white paper, right? So if you look at both version one and version two of you know, the white paper that Dan Larimer uh, and the rest of block one put together, um, including by the way, a tiny, tiny bit of input from me on version two, uh, the expectation clearly was, I mean, the design principle was that voters would be activist voters and they would, uh, they would help police the block producers and express their policy preferences, um, and their, their expectations of block producer behavior through their votes. And I don't know that that's been happening. I, I can't point to a single um, clear signal from voters to block producers that they prefer this or that, that they prefer, let's say, let's pick a couple of you know common issues right now. Should uh, block producers support uh, rulings that come from ECAF on specific uh, ECAF uh, cases? You know, they, they signed a couple early on and then they block producers generally stopped signing them. And some block producers have been very vocally critical of ECAF and some have been kind of silent and I'm not sure how many have been supportive, but I haven't seen the votes move in response to that. Um, we had a vote buying scandal. Uh, that's kind of a big deal. And that's something that all uh, delegated proof of stake chains have to struggle with is vote buying and collusion uh, and things that undermine block producer independence. Um, you would have expected that to move some numbers around. Didn't see it. Uh, and that's weird. Uh, and so at this point, I'm wondering, you know, to what extent the EOS mainnet can count on activist voters to maintain a uh, block producer discipline, or if that's, if the block producers are going to become kind of the center of power and they'll just do whatever they want to. Uh, recently, in addition to saying no ECAF, uh, I've had a, a two or three block producers have gone so far. Uh, EO Stack in particular, uh, Michael Yates, has said that the block producers should just throw away the current constitution and put in another one if they want to. That they have the power to do it, so they should just do it. Like, that's not what you agreed to in Reg Producer, and that's not what the constitution says you're supposed to do. The constitution has a process for amending the constitution. Why would you not follow that? Um, but, you know, the the alternative viewpoint is a viewpoint. And hey, the alliance doesn't pick, pick sides, right? So the best I can say is, 
if that's interesting and important to voters, then um, I would hope voters will vote you know, either in favor of EOSTAC because they agree uh, with that view or maybe withdraw their votes from EOSTAC if they strongly think that that's a bad idea. Um, but, you know, bless them for at least taking a clear stand. Uh, but the risk uh, or the, the prospect of block producers, uh, you know, upending the Constitution, picking their own and just sticking it in with 15 votes without a referendum, that's, uh, that's new. Uh, and it undermines a lot of the expectations I think we've all set with each other around how change will happen on the US mainnet. Uh, and then more recently, last few days, we've even seen some chatter suggesting that block producers should just pull money out of the EOS savings and pay themselves. Like, <laughs> that, uh, oh, you're going to raid, you're going to raid the bank. You're going to raid the savings account because you can. Not because you're entitled to, not because you're allowed to, not because anyone authorized you to, but just no one's, no one's stopping us. So let's just do that. Like, wow. If that yeah. It's, it's kind of funny, but maybe that'll wake up token holders, though. <laughs> maybe you have to do something drastic, like drastically bad, to to wake up token holders to to vote them out. So, uh, uh, right, we have to identify who's who's championing which which viewpoint. Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge some of Mel's and Patrick's comments. Uh, Mel points out the communication is key, ideally through a single source, very scattered at the moment. I think that's true. Uh, and he would like to see a new official YouTube channel that gives regular updates on EOS, could bring in a bigger audience. Um, hey, dude, I'm up for that if you are, as long as I can get Jun to come on. <laughs> yeah, I'll help out anytime, anytime, Thomas. Yeah, we, we got we to gotta get our regulars in there. Can't, it can't be all me. Um, and I don't want to, you know, take the oxygen away from somebody else. So, for instance, uh, Let's see, yeah, Patrick asks, is the Alliance going to collaborate or planning to or already collaborate with the Link Foundation? Uh, that's what I was mentioning earlier about uh, trying to link East and West. Um, we're getting, we've been focused the last month or so really on the Constitution and on getting ready for a referendum and preparing ballot language guidance and helping educate people on what the choices are. So we haven't really thought too much about how to coordinate with them. But absolutely, if the Link Foundation is uh, doing what I th think it's doing, which is uh, helping East and West communicate and understand each other, then it's absolutely within my, I'm, I'm sort of expected and required to help them in whatever way they'd like to be helped, uh, either by augmenting them or getting out of their way or pointing people to them or, you know, retweeting their stuff or, you know, whatever, whatever feels right. Uh, so you can expect in the January to February timeframe that we'll start uh, having more formal relationship with Link Foundation to the extent they would they would like that. Again, we we can't and don't want to ever force anyone to do anything. So so what do you you know? I think this is a great initiative to since there is still a little bit of a disconnect between East and West. How do you see that those meetings? Like, what what do you think can make the meetings most effective in terms of like language and format of of these uh uh yeah it's just because because language is always the, the biggest uh yep. bottleneck or absolutely uh yeah language uh, and culture okay. so uh i think one of the things that we're really blessed with is um that the alliance has attracted both volunteers and paid staff from uh, all the major communities we've got korean chinese uh english european south american African, uh, and so on, uh, folks contributing in various channels. Uh, we've on the constitution side, we've translated everything into each language and we've held, uh, native in Mandarin calls in a good time, in a good time slot for people in mainland China. And then we summarize that and translate it. And then we do one in, in Russian that was all volunteer driven. Uh, and we have one in Korean. It's run by the Korean community, again, sponsored by the Alliance. And so we would tend to put the same questions in front of each group, and then they would challenge, they would come up with whatever their responses were. Uh, and then that kind of went on steroids about three or four weeks ago, five weeks ago, when Justin Buck 
stepped up out of nowhere and uh, said, oh, okay, so I see that we're about to uh, get ready for a referendum. We're, we're done talking about the Constitution. It's time to write a ballot that you could vote on to pick a Constitution. What might that look like? Uh, and I'm like, I would love someone to do that. How can I support someone to do that? And Justin just said, I'll do it. So he's been the person braiding together all the different uh, work streams uh, that have, you know, translating, writing, uh, the ballot crafters, uh, staying in touch with the referendum folks, uh, and so forth. So flipping huge. Uh, and having a, a kind of a regular schedule of things where we try to talk about the same topic across three calls in three languages in the same week, that seems to work pretty well. Uh, and I'd be curious to see what, you know, January and February bring. Maybe we add more languages. Uh, don't know. Uh, I know that it would be great to have uh, the EOS Alliance website. I think um, really we've underutilized it so far because we've been focused so much on on the referendum for constitution. But I see no reason why we can't have, say, a, uh, a page or a set of pages dedicated to uh, all the different YouTube channels that are out. And you can go there and see, you know, in reverse chronological order, new at the newest at the top, what's come out recently. And so if you want to get your EOS fix, you can come there and say YouTube channels and medium articles and, you know, blog entries, what's up with EOS nation, what's up with the link foundation, um, and have all that be there. Um, I think that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a great, great place for aggregation of all, all the content out there. So. Yeah. Cause I think, I think there's a lot of people who are very happy to generate content. A lot of it's really good. Uh, and having a one place to go to, to, to see it and, and browse it would be uh, a real service to the community. And that's something that we can afford to do. Uh, and I would yeah. like Especially with the translations too. So, you know, like, you know, it'll be a global aggregator. Uh, so, you know, I'd go there to, you know, see what's going on with all the other, you know, countries. Um, yeah, I'll be curious how we handle on one page all the languages. Do we have like a filter and you like pick your language? Yeah. Um, leave it yeah. unfiltered and see like, you know, four or five different languages all there. <laughs> Chronological. Yeah. Be. That, sounds like, that sounds like a lot of work. I, I look forward to seeing that come to fruition. <laughs> wondering how i'm gonna make that good, good, good luck thomas <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, i'm happy to sign up for all kinds of work here <laughs> we shall see oh yeah there's a question another question on the ask a question um, oh super yeah uh they have kyc on chain and not a third party server subject to attack yeah so it was a real good question of, of how we want to you know, how does the community want to do identity? Um, and, you know, who's responsible for KYC and what then gets published as a result? Um, and so I want to uh, separate the idea of identity from um, pseudo identity and reputation. Uh, and I think that, um, well, people who are more knowledgeable than I am have, have said, and I tend to agree with them, that you can get overly fixated on trying to identify like this person's online login is associated with which real world person and what real world information can we find and attach to that identity. And that's actually a lot less interesting to most of us most of the time compared to, is this person going to keep their word? Um, so when this person says something, can I trust it? Uh, is this person a jerk? <laughs> You know, if someone is nice and intelligent and adds value in conversation and can be trusted to show up for meetings and, and do what they say they'll do, I don't care that they they go by, you know, Hans Gruber, which is a character from Die Hard. It's like, and they have a little picture, you know, still frame from the Die Hard movie. And then we never find out that it's actually some, you know, teenage girl in Latvia. It's like, I don't care. Okay. If you're showing up and you're doing the work, and, and over time, you build that reputation. That itself is is pretty interesting. Uh, and if it can, if it's appropriate to attach it to a real world identity, okay, great. But 
within the community, your community identity is kind of self-contained uh, and it needs to be more fully developed. Now, I did some work on this um, many, many months ago to try to articulate what is it that would be most useful to me as a user. And it's not knowing what Jun's middle name is or what street he lives on. I don't see how that does me any good. Um, what I would like to know is what do other people or he joined himself attest to be true about Jun and of the things that they may attest to, like maybe his height or his weight or his eye color or something, which of those things matter to me and which things do I rely on? So you can pretty easily imagine a web of data where uh, I stipulate that I live in Oregon and somebody else also stipulates that Thomas lives in Oregon. And you get several people who stipulate that and then you realize there's no sales tax in Oregon. And so you sell me something and you don't hold the sales tax out. Okay, you just did something financial based on an assertion that I made. Now, if I'm lying to you and you actually owe sales tax, like there's a monetary hammer coming at you now because you believed me when I said this. So, but the blockchain can show who promised that this, that, you know, you didn't have to do the sales tax thing because when you sold something to Thomas and could even say, who are the different people who promised it and how much money did they put behind their promise? Because an empty promise is, it has no money attached to it. Whereas a promise that I say, and in fact, here's my performance bond and I, you can come after me if I, uh, I'll guarantee all my answers up to a hundred dollars per claim. So, Okay. Well, that's a very different ball of wax. That's a very different game now. Uh, and so assertions that are useful, uh, that are meaningful for the transaction you're engaging in and that are backed by uh, assets or, or insurance or uh, some way of, you know, proving that you relied on somebody's assertion and that any injury you received, uh, you deserve compensation for seen some good chatter here. Let me pause for a second. Uh, Mel's asserting that identity is very difficult to resolve and is key. I think there's some truth to that. And Mel has to run. Uh, thank you, Mel, for popping in. Really appreciate having you on the show. And I appreciate your comments. Uh, Patrick goes on to say that KYC on chain can avoid man in the middle or middle server. Uh, and I would take that one further and say, that the work being done by uh, Erio on securing access to data is to me extraordinarily interesting. Um, I'll try to summarize it for folks who don't know. Um, Erio secures medical record information, but they don't store it on the blockchain. They store the secure information off chain in multiple redundant servers. But what they do provide is an access control list on the chain. Now, here's why that's important. At any given moment, the blockchain has an agreed state that we all agree is true. And that state can tell you who has access to Fred's medical record right now. And Fred can grant to his general practitioner or doctor uh, access for today, for right now, uh, the ability to read from and write to that medical record for the duration of that visit. And then when the visit's over, access goes away. And so it's not, you're not storing your medical record in the doctor's server in the doctor's office where it can be hacked. It's, you know, offline encrypted in Erio servers, which by the way are redundantly located in various places. And the way you get access to it is you go to the blockchain and say, may I have access please? And you can go back and say who had access when and what kind of access did they have and what did they do with that access? And you can even prove that you did or didn't see certain practitioners. And if someone like tries to bill your insurance for service you didn't provide, you can just go, look, I, he never had access to my records the day he supposedly, you know, provided me with this expensive service he's trying to bill my insurance for. Uh, there's no evidence that he ever even saw me. And so that kind of advanced thinking around safeguarding access to very sensitive data uh, is a really, really big deal. Uh, I encourage folks to read the Erio white paper. They talk about the idea that Bruce Schneier, 
uh, have popularized called toxic data. Uh, Schneier, you may know, is one of the most famous deep thinkers around computer security uh, and security generally. He's one of the guys I I look to uh, for good, clear-headed thinking about security. And what Schneier said about toxic data is there's certain classes of data that you don't want to store. You should treat it like toxic waste, like treat it carefully, lock it up, account for it, don't keep it around. And he goes so far as to say you shouldn't even have a database full of your customer sensitive information if you can avoid having it. Literally don't store it if you don't need to. Find ways to avoid storing that stuff. And Erio gives you a great way to do that. That you could say, hey, I want your information to be my customer, KYC. But all I really have to do is give you one-time access through an Erio like service to this vetted, signed, provable, you know, here's my information, here's proof that I'm me and you have access to it for as long as you need it for your transaction. And then when we're done transacting, you don't have any access to that information. And with and we could, in theory, even set it up so that you aren't able to make copies. So, and they spelled I-R-Y-O. I'll put that in chat. Really good white paper, really thoughtful, advanced thinking. They're an Eastern European uh, startup. Super cool stuff. So as we're as we're talking about um, the sort of like wrapping up end of the year, looking at uh, EOS and, and blockchain governance, um, I've been trying to do a lot of reading about what other people have said about governance on blockchain. So a guy named uh, Ralph Merkel, you may have heard the name Merkel from Merkel Trees. Yes, that guy, same guy. Uh, Mr. Merkel wrote a very long, like 20, 30 page uh, essay on blockchain governance. Uh, Vlad Zamfir has written some things. There's a guy, uh, Ursham. I've been reading his stuff. And what I come to believe is that most blockchain practitioners today have no flippant idea what, what governance really is. Um, they have narrow understanding of their piece of it. You know, how do I change this protocol when, you know, no one controls the network? That's part of it. But governance is much more. Governance is collective decision-making. Governance is how does a decentralized community make a decision that's binding on the community? Because, and you only care about that when two things are true. This is classic right out of the literature from 1962. Collective decisions are relevant when the cost of unanimity is very high. It's very expensive and difficult to get unanimous agreement. And it's also true that it's very expensive if you don't get any agreement. And if both of those are true, then you've got a governance issue. And if they're not both true, you don't. So let's repeat that. The cost of unanimity is high, but the cost of not deciding as high. So what's an example? Well, we have a bug and we need to fix it, but we're a decentralized blockchain. And so getting everybody to pay attention in like literally 100% agreement, you might never get that, even for the most catastrophic bug. So how much agreement do you need to allow you to move ahead and make the fix, knowing that attackers could use the fix uh, system to break or attack the chain. So you want to have a pretty high bar for the change, but not so high you can't do it. So I'll put that in. Um, you have a... Patrick wants an equation. <laughs> I'm going to type this in. Jen, talk while I type. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I, 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 and where did you get that, um, I guess, you know, the concept of, you know, the, the cost of unanimity has to be high and, and uh, you know, the, the, the cost of indecision would be high. And I, I'm sure, yeah. I guess, the others so, will fall in see. there. I've got the book here somewhere. It's, yeah. um, this is 
not the standard cover. But uh, Calculus of Consent is the name of the book. Oh, Calculus okay. of Consent. Gotcha. 1962, gotcha. Tulloch and Buchanan. Um, and they, they were revolutionary at the time. Uh, yeah, I got I got to pick that up. <laughs> it's it's a, I guess reading, really hard to read. Uh, I got spoiled because I was reading some Thomas Schelling. He's he's by the way, if you want to look at like the 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 battle, like like the the game theory of um, blockchain and you know how do you set up the incentives so that people do the right thing and don't do the wrong thing. When you're thinking about that, Shelling is your guy. Uh, in the book, you want a strategy of conflict. I'll put that in. Strategy and conflict. Okay, great. Yeah. Of, of conflict. Of conflict. Strategy of conflict. Yeah, Thomas Shelling, strategy of conflict. And he was the first guy to really talk about game theory in asymmetric cases where it's not you know, a prisoner's dilemma or some of these other really uh, constrained uh, examples, but much more real world where – you and I might be in conflict, but my success condition is not the same as your success condition. It's not like chess. We're both trying to checkmate each other. Like we might have very asymmetric approaches where we're in sort of conflict, but it's not an intrinsic conflict. It's a real world conflict. Um, oh yeah. Theory of constraints is a very good book. Yeah, I know exactly what you're thinking of. It's called uh, the goal. Uh, and I'm spacing the name of the author, but it's very, very good. Um, but I don't think that the goal is going to, yeah, it's project management. Uh, what Schelling points out is that there's a lot of um, subtlety to setting up um, accountability systems and making things like credible threats and credible promises. Like even if I, let's say, here, here's a classic example from his book. You know, somebody kidnaps somebody. And so the kidnapper gets the ransom and and the kidnappy would really like to be let go but the kidnapper is like yeah but you've seen my face you might testify i'm scared that you'll come after me the kidnapper's like i will what can i possibly say to convince you to let me go and live because i you know but what promise could you make that you could be held to and so you both would like to come to some agreement where you can be bound to your promise to not rat your kidnapper out because if you if he doesn't believe you he'll kill you and you don't want to be killed but how what can you say what document could you sign what what offer could you make uh it's challenging uh he suggests one thing you could do is offer blackmail material it's like <laughs> okay if I turn you in, you can release the following information that's true about me that I don't want anyone to know, <laughs> right? And so you kind of get a hold on each other. So if, you know, if you, but if you release it, you know, unprovoked, I can come after you for the kidnapping, right? So it's kind of a mutually assured destruction deal there. But it's it's hard. Uh, there are some legitimately hard challenges there. Uh, you know, how do you get people to follow rules? How do you make the rules enforceable? It's all the stuff we've seen in EOS mainnet. You know, when you say no, by the way, when you say no vote buying, one of the big pushbacks I got from the computer science folks is like, well, you can't enforce that. Like you can't enforce it in code, right? Because you can't detect back channel deals. Like, look, well, I, I pay for your vote, but I don't pay for it on chain with a smart contract. I pay for it, you know, through Binance where no one can track the transaction. Uh, and part of the reason you outlaw things, even if they're hard to enforce, like say every single law against fraud ever written, because I promise you fraud is always a buy willing buyer and a willing seller. But think about that, right? I mean, libertarians say no force and no fraud, but fraud is you know, willing buyer and a willing seller. The problem is what you're selling isn't yours to sell. Yeah, no, that's interesting too. I mean, uh, there, there's kind of the deceit part, right? Uh, in fraud, uh, where yeah, that, that you're basically uh, selling out your duty of loyalty to your boss, right? You uh, set up a shell company, and instead of buying office supplies from Office Depot, you buy office supplies from 
Fred's office supplies, which is secretly run by your cousin. And he just goes to Office Depot, buys it, sells it to you for 10% markup, and you split the markup. And so you're just sucking money out of your company. And if no one comes and checks your work and audits you, they'll never know. Hey, willing buyer, willing seller. Except the company's not willing. And it's their money being wasted. So, yeah. The, you, and the, one of the reasons to outlaw something like vote buying is it means that any contract that you enter into with somebody is unenforceable. And taking away the enforceability of the contract helps weaken the relationship between the buyer and the seller. And if you can then add in things like whistleblower statutes and payments for uh, informants, uh, you can do a pretty long way to uh, at least controlling the corruption. You may never outlaw it completely. But again, you're not going for 100%. You just want to make sure that the level of corruption is low enough not to hurt the economy. Uh, and corruption is extremely dangerous for economies. And in terms of a, a DPoS blockchain corruption, where you lose independence among block producers, can destroy the chain completely. People can start devoting themselves money. And when they can vote themselves money, it just collapses. So uh, those of you who care about the EOS mainnet, you know, keep your eyes open and, and be diligent. And uh, look, look for things you can do to fight uh, corruption, collusion, lawlessness uh, of, of various kinds. All right. So we got Patrick. Um, and uh, yeah, vote buying is interesting too. I mean, this is uh, it's, it's kind of interesting just to think about all the different, uh, uh, I guess, you yeah, would think about permutations. Well, you know, there was this thing about Huobi supposedly buying votes and how did the public find out about it? A disgruntled employee released a spreadsheet full of a detailed information that lined up apparently very well with, you know, the on-chain transactions. Now, Patrick points out here in the comments that normally with DPoS and Byzantine fault tolerance, the block producer would be incentivized to not behave in a bad manner if they could be caught. And if you have a mechanism for punishing them, but your primary mechanism for punishing block producers is to vote them out of office, which requires activist voters. And right now we don't have activist voters. So how do we get them? How do we get them? So now I don't think Max asks again, what smiles and t-shirts? No, I don't think that that's a big deal because if I get the t-shirt now and then I don't vote for you later, you're not going to come take t-shirt back. It's too late. That's just goodwill. But I'm talking about conditional payments, where if you, if you do cast a vote a certain way, you do get the thing of value. And if you don't cast the vote, you don't get the thing of value. That's vote buying. Uh, and it's it's usually pretty clear. Hey, I need to wrap things up. And, and I, we've been on for almost an hour. Uh, if there's specific questions, um, Patrick says he's happy that we have uh, intent. The intent of code is law. I, I'm glad, too. And I'm looking forward to that maturing and getting to a place where it can be uh, really seen for the success that it could be. Um, but for now, my call, my, my call to action to you is get educated uh, about the constitutional options that are coming up. Encourage the block producers to get the referendum like loaded. <laughs> get it in there. Uh, and push uh, voters and friends of yours who are voting to uh, to be activist about it uh, and, and educate yourself on, on what the big issues are. And to me, the the biggest issue uh, today, if it were me, if it was up to me, it would be uh, either to vote for or vote against EOS DAC based on the policy of saying the Constitution should be ignored. Because uh, Michael Yates of EOS DAC says the Constitution is meaningless. It doesn't enforce itself. It should be ignored. Block producers should be able to do whatever they want. And if he says that and nothing changes, then it tells me voters aren't paying attention or they don't care. And if he says that and gets more votes, then he is with the community and he is a, a bellwether and he is leading uh, a revolution in a very specific direction. And we should all notice that. Uh, and if he loses votes in any appreciable number, that's also information. 
So um, I think that's a perfect example of where uh, the community, the voters could and should make their, their preferences known. How do you see the, the referendum since it's going to start uh, soon uh, in January 1st, yeah. January 1st? We think. I mean, we have to get the code passed. There's It's still ha hung up in uh, getting the multi-sig. Uh, okay, so hopefully that'll... We've got 14 of 15 signatures for part one, and it has to get pushed through, and then part two has to come in and get 15 signatures. And so I would have thought it would have been done by now, but I think the holidays have slowed things down. Okay, so maybe maybe a little bit after you know maybe the second week of uh, January. I'm hoping, I think I think we can do January first. It's not that hard. Okay, all right. So yeah, how exactly. do you, is it possible for BP to be non political? No, no, it's a political role. It's yeah, so that's a political role. That's what I want to see as well. Like BP is really just taking a stand on all, all of these issues, and um, I, I think. Yeah, it's it's. I think people are just too yeah. neutral. Take a stand and, and and take your votes or lose them. And if you lose votes for a stand, you can change your stand. Yeah, exactly. But exactly. you know, but if the voters are ignoring these things, then we're in much much deeper trouble. And this, you know, the chatter among some block producers saying that they should just go take money out of the savings account because they can, and the voters don't care. That's a short road to disaster, in my opinion. And maybe that's what the voters want. Okay, great. Again, the alliance can't pick a side. We can just ask people to decide. And this is this is a chance to decide. This is a time to uh, pick pick your values and vote them. Uh, Patrick has one more question. When we do a meetup about EOS, want to push the EOS alliance statement? Oh, good. Well, hey, get in touch with me. I will give you a video recording and, and or the slides uh, and or we might have someone come visit you live for your meetup. Just uh, Just get in touch. And my Telegram handle is at sign. Okay. I really do got to run. Thank you so much. Appreciate all the work you do, John. Appreciate your audience very much. Yeah, sounds good. Hey, we'll, we'll talk hopefully in the beginning of the new year when, when things are official with the referendum. And, you know, I'm if excited. Happens, yeah. <laughs> hoping, crossing fingers. Yeah. Sounds good, guys. Yeah, it's, it's great to just close out the new year and just hopefully you guys uh, just enjoy the last few few days of uh, 2018. And it's only been seven months. Know. How much has happened? Right. <laughs> yeah, Take reflect care. a little bit and uh, uh, see you, Thomas. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll go at it and we'll have we'll start the new year strong with another episode uh, next next week. But uh, I guess in the meantime. I guess reflecting on 2018 and uh, just maybe cleaning up <laughs> and uh, getting everything in order for uh, 2019 would be uh, be something I think a lot of people are thinking about doing. So that's what I personally plan on doing. So thanks a lot for for hanging out with me all throughout since the you know beginning of the, these sessions, and I'll see you guys out there. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, just kind of reach out to me, you know, uh, on Telegram. And uh, uh, I'll see you guys next time. Take care. See you, Max.